And everybody said amen. Amen, 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 amen. Would you turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. Today we're starting a new series. Just been a little bit agitated in my spirit about the deconstruction that's taking place in people's lives and their faith. And we're going to take a little bit of time to look at Nehemiah, one of the greatest examples in Scripture of how to rebuild something. And the reconstruction process is powerful. There's so much in the, you know, we're going to get to more of that next week. I'm just going to start this week. But let me just say, the greatest thing that you can do to rebuild your life is to begin praying. As you start praying, God starts working. Amen? And I just want to do a shameless plug for this book right here. If you want this book, it's in the back. You can sign it out, the book on prayer. And we'll be talking more about what all this means right here throughout this sermon. But I'm wondering if maybe today you can hear a pastor's heart that nothing, nothing changes and like prayer changes things. Amen? Nothing changes things like prayer changes things. Philippians chapter 3, in verse 10, I want to read the words of Paul. It's an epistle of Paul who is an apostle. And if you're there, say amen. Verse 10 says, that I may know him. Everyone say, know him. I don't understand, Paul. Shipwrecks, missionary trips. How do you not know God? He said, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. By any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, that I might obtain that which I've been obtained, that I might take over through knowing Jesus. I'm going to just pray for a little while and talk to you about prayer and preach and pray all at the same time, I think. I think that's appropriate. I just feel so overwhelmed with this message to talk to you about time with God, time with God. Would you pray with me, Jesus? Get us out of the way and let your spirit move that we might be receiving what you want to say to us today in your precious name. And everybody said amen. You may be seated. I did forget all the cheerful givers in the house. Please forgive me for that. I did forget the offering today. There was a poor man in... uh, He was talking with God in prayer because someone said, go ahead and pray. God will hear you. And as he prayed, he said, Lord, how long is a million years? I like to start with something funny. You kind of know it. The smirk on my face is where I'm going with this. How long is a million years? And God said, oh, it's, it's only but a second to me. And he's like, okay, Lord, well, No, I'm poor and I need some things. How much is a million dollars to you, God? And God said, oh, it's only but a dollar to me. And then the poor man said, God, would you give me a dollar? And God said, absolutely, just one second. (laughs) Prayer is the imperative of improvements. Prayer changes your mind when nothing else will. Putting yourself into a place of prayer, whether it's a prayer closet, it's your car, it's some place where you specifically have chosen and set time aside to spend time with God, that location, wherever that's at, that is where God can change you through the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm not preaching a new concept today. I'm not talking about just simple time investment, but it is important that we understand that there is nothing done that does not cost us time if you're going to make change. Time investment is simply the only way to make lasting change. Everybody say, you got to put the work in. You got to put the work in. Nothing gets better without an investment of time. 
We need to pray. There's plenty of examples in the scripture of men and women praying and God answering. There are examples of ways to pray. I, I've prayed prayers that I didn't think God was going to answer sometimes because my faith was low, and I've prayed prayers believing God was going to do it absolutely 100%. I've prayed surprising prayers where I was surprised by the answer, and I've prayed prayers where I was surprised that God didn't answer. But every time you pray, God is going to move or do something. It may not be a yes, but it might be a, and it might be a no, but it might also not be either one of those. It may be a wait because the timing's not right. And if we trust God with the plan, whatever that is, we will spend time with God regardless of the answer because the most important thing in our life is to be in his presence. That's what I'm trying to communicate is, is time with God is the most important thing, not whether your prayers get answered the way you'd like for them to get answered or whether you receive what you wished you would have received, but when you spend time in God's presence, how he answers your prayers is, is not as important as who you're with in those those moments spending time with God. We want a better relationship with God, and so therefore we must invest time in that relationship. I am so blessed to have someone who's put up with me for so long that I have a lovely wife who's, who dealt with all of my in, inconsistencies as a young man that walked through all the raising up of the, the wounds of a boy and brought forth a man, and she has stayed with me this whole time. But imagine if I tell Sarah I love her her, but I only spend time with her if she follows me around on the mowing lawnmower. If I'm like, I love you, babe, but I, I got to work on the car. Why don't you come on outside? Or I love you, babe, but I'm going to drive here. Why don't you just ride along? Or I love you, babe, I, I got to work on this mailbox. Can you just stand out there with me? I love you, babe, but I'm just going to do this right here or that. After a while, even though she doesn't mind being my sidekick in some of those things, eventually she wants specific and individual dedicated time sitting down and working through our relationship together. If I never exclusively give her time, there is a question that will arise eventually, do you really love me enough to make me a priority? And I wonder if maybe the church of the living God, even in America, has gotten so busy that we've put God over top of our busy life instead of turning off our busy life to spend time with God. I wonder if maybe we can get back to a place in our heart where we say, I'm going to dedicate precious, valuable time, time I will never get back. But if I give him time, he will give me his eternity. If I invest myself in him, he will give back so much more. I understand that when I spend time in God's presence, I am specifically and willingly saying, God, you know better than I do. You have better plans than than I have, and you can take care of me better. God is the guide of our life, brothers and sisters. Jeremiah told us that men are not fit to guide their own life. Jeremiah tells us this in many different places, in, in one place in Scripture, but I want you to understand that if we don't know that time investment in God's, in, in our relationship with God is so valuable, we will slip away and drift into a place where he just rides along with us, or he just shows up at work when we're there, he just helps us get through our projects instead of spending time with him. And the same is true if someone was to grab my cell phone and begin to text my wife, she would know immediately that it's not me because she spends time with me. And if you don't spend time with God in prayer, you may not know when there's a word that comes, if it's from God or not. When you get a word from the Lord, you need to have a relationship with him enough. See, we don't just read this word to understand his character and his nature, but we read this word to understand what his voice sounds like. And when we hear his voice speaking, we know that he's going to show up and back up what he says. We need a connection with God. Amen. And so there are several things that prayer does for us. I don't want you to confuse the fact that God moves in very special ways all the time. I have some very unique prayers that I've prayed over my life. 
and God has answered them. We were out at a church event. We all decided, judge it or not, but we all decided we were going to go to a Brewer game. Some of you know the story. And I don't usually use this line where I say, Lord, don't make me beg, but I was actually honoring God by saying it because he has the cattle on a thousand hills. Amen. He has all the resources. I carried my mid in to the park. It was Miller Park at the time, but carried my mid in. My daughter was there. We were first innings about to start, and my daughter goes, Dad, would you catch a baseball for me? And I was like, you bet. Uh, yeah, if it comes to me, I'll get you that baseball, honey. And it was the eighth inning, and I was tired of waiting. So Rob and Tanya were sitting right here, right behind me, and I stood up, and I put my mitt on my hand, and I went, God, don't make me beg. And I just did one of those, just prop my mitt right there. And I looked at Tanya and Rob and winked, you know, like, yep. I'm like, God, don't make me beg. And crack, as I said it, they can be my witness. As I said it, crack off a pirate's bat, it starts turning toward the third baseline, and I'm like, oh, boy, here comes my answer to prayer at 210 miles an hour. How am I going to catch this? And I literally moved my glove from here, God, don't make me beg, to right here to catch that ball. I have never had another prayer answered quite like that one. But you can believe I have asked the Lord, Lord, don't make me beg, thinking that might work again. I caught that ball. My hand was on fire. I mean, that came in so hot. I literally lined up with it out there, and it was in my mid. And I like, I think an angel started like out there and just brought it to my mid. I caught it in front of a woman's face. I saved her from going to the hospital. And it was just, a, it was an amazing moment. And I'm like, my hand is just ringing. I'm just in pain, and I'm going, oh, man, that hurts. And I look down, and the ball is gone. And I'm like, I, I felt it. It hurt. It should be in my mid. And I said, where did it go? And all of a sudden, someone goes, your daughter's got it. She believed so much in her dad that she ran down, got that ball, and she was headed up the stairs to tell her friends, look what I got. Look what my dad got for me. I can't take her to any of the sporting events because now I got to catch footballs. I got to catch basketballs. I got to come across with this big dad promise now. I fulfilled it with the baseball. Now everything else has got to be too much for me to do. But when you spend time with God, you know immediately what God can do. And you ask big things of your father. My little daughter had no idea what she had asked. She had no idea that I wasn't a professional level catcher. And she had no idea that those ball coming off the bat comes in at nearly 170 miles an hour. She had no idea what it took to even have a baseball come to me in that moment. The, the chances of a ball flying into the stands where I was standing. She didn't know any of that. All she did was, Daddy, can you catch me a ball? Sometimes we need to have that kind of faith. We don't have to know what it's going to cost. We don't know, have to know how it's going to get arranged. We don't have to know how God's going to do it or all the factors and the science involved. When you walk to an altar and say, God, would you heal me? Father, would you touch my kids? Father, would you help? Would you, would you do it? God will say, yes, let me take care of it. Because you put your faith and your trust in me, I will organize things in a way that makes no sense to a scientist, makes no sense to buoyancy of water, I will let you walk out of a boat, Peter, if you ask your father to do so. I will do it for you. I can change even the molecular structure of what's going on in your body and remove cancer at a moment that you ask, Father, can you do it? The power of prayer changes everything. And you are every day given the gift of spending time with the God who spins the universe. If I can impress you today, I would tell you that he loves you more than you know. And as men and as women, we're often in our society shown things that are not like God at all. We're shown things like you get 
get things from God as blessings, and you're supposed to climb the ladder. and You, you, you get better and better and better and better and better with God's blessings. But God did something completely different. He had all splendor and all glory and all power. And the Bible says he made the stars also. Five words for what you see at night. You want to be blown away by five words? Drive out to Zion National Park when it gets dark and there's no light pollution and look up into the Milky Way. He made all of that in five words in your Bible. That's the God we serve. He was the highest of the highest. He's the superlative of all that is good. And he said, I'll divest my. We want to get in the door, start working and work our way up the ladder. That's how men think of it. But God said, I will have it all and lay it all down that I might come and spend time with you. This is the God you have an opportunity of speaking with every morning. This is the God you have an opportunity of calling on when you're driving on your way to work. This is the God that you can say, Lord, I want to seek your face. And Scripture tells us in very powerful ways that he moves in our midst when we change our desires. Of course, I can tell you out of all the prayers he's answered, I'm thankful for the times whenever a brother or sister has walked up and prayed for me and I had not talked to them, I had not told them anything, they didn't even know what was going on in my life, and God dropped some words in their mouth prophetically to pray over me. This just happened. This isn't something I'm talking about that doesn't happen. A couple weeks ago, I was having some real hip pain. I don't, I don't know what was going on. Don't I'm not looking for sympathy. I'm just saying this knee is bothering me right even now. I'm having like shooting pain down that leg. And I didn't know what it was. I don't know what's going on. And I had told no one because I, I have a high tolerance for pain. Thank the Lord I have a high tolerance for pain because, you know, when you're like me, uh, you do some dumb stuff sometimes. And if you're going to be dumb, you have to be strong, you know. Just kidding. The redneck motto. But what I found out was I came over here and I was just praying and I was just talking to the Lord. I hadn't even told my wife. This is how beautiful God is. I hadn't even told my wife that I was dealing with some hip pain and knee pain on this side. And Brother Rob walks up, puts his hand on my back, and he said, God gave me a dream last night that you were having hip pain. Nobody knew. Nobody knew what I was dealing with. I didn't want to bother anybody. Have you ever been there? Oh, I don't bother, bother everybody with it. I'm okay. Everybody else has their own pains and their own struggles, and it's fine. I'll just take it to the Lord. I took it to Jesus, and God talked to somebody to come pray for me when he should have never known about it. I'm thankful that God will speak to us in our prayer times. I'm thankful that God will find us in dreams and visions, and he'll speak to us and help us, and he'll send somebody to you with a word that says, you know what, you may not even know that I know, but I'm going to pray for you, and God will put something in his mouth. I've been praying before just standing in the altar and my foot is hurting and a lie will come up and she'll put her hand on me she doesn't even know what she's praying she's just going father would you bless and she just has an open spirit and the other two three weeks ago my foot was hurting I don't know if I just had a shoe thing or something and my foot was hurting nobody knew about that and Aliyah comes up and Lord bless my pastor it was a little awkward but hey love it anyways and she just kind of long distance like I'm out I'm out here Lord bless my pastor and she's doing one of those, and then all of a sudden she goes, would you just touch his foot pain? There's no way she would have known what she said. But God knew, and God can do it. I'm asking you just today to understand that God can move in moments that you did not even understand he would move. And God can touch, amen? So let me give this to you quickly as we start this series. I, I just want to break this down for you. 
understand that there's been a, an overwhelming deconstruction of faith going on in our world. And yes, we have the fall of man, we have sin, we have disease, and we have sickness, but there are people taking to social platforms to show their deconstruction of their faith, and they're walking away from God. And I can tell you that the world that we're living in is struggling with all kinds of mental situations because they do not have the power of God in their life. And my prayer is this, that we will get a prayer life that guides us into God's presence, that allows us to pray for them and be sincere about it and walk through life with people that need to hear Jesus Christ. Number one, prayer life is most important. God guides us. Being guided by God is the greatest gift you could ever have. Amen? Amen, somebody? Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Scripture says, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, head and shoulders above the rest. Do you know what it took to become a Pharisee? They had to memorize the Torah. They were men. Paul was a man of great wisdom. Some say between 11 and maybe even 15 languages he could speak. But nonetheless, Paul said that I may know him. And the power, the man who was qualified to be a Pharisee at the highest level, knew God's word, memorization, had God's word in his heart. He said, I want to know God and the power of his resurrection. I want to know what it's like to have God's spirit inside me so great that his resurrection power resonates in me that brings me life every morning and life throughout my day and builds life into me so that when I pray, my life builds, is built up by the power of knowledge of God, the power and knowledge of God. It, number one, everybody say, a prayer life builds you. While the Bible doesn't certainly, and thank you, Sarah, while the Bible certainly doesn't um, say those specific words in Jude 1 and 20, we understand that the word says this, but you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. In other words, praying in the Holy Spirit, there's two things in Scripture. Number one is praying in your knowledge praying in your knowledge or praying in the spirit. One, one is referring to praying in tongues and the other is referred to praying in your natural born language. When you pray in your natural born language, it's very powerful. But there's something even more powerful when you pray in the Holy Ghost because when you pray in the tongues and you pray in the Holy Ghost, you are praying in the perfect will of God. When you pray in your language, you may pray prayers that are not in the perfect will of God. You desire to be, but you might pray amiss. But when you pray in the Holy Ghost, you can literally begin to have intercessory prayer and groaning come through your spirit to God's spirit because you're praying in perfect alignment with God's will. That's why having the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues is so very much preached in this church. This verse tells us that we have to pray in the Holy Spirit. The verse encourages the believer to build themselves up in faith through prayer. Amen? And then 1 Corinthians 14, 4, it says, Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. While this verse is talking about someone speaking in tongues, edifying themselves, it doesn't say build yourself up, but edifies means to, to, to encourage, one another, encourage oneself. And so you can see that Scripture is, in, is very much telling us that a prayer life is necessary for us to be encouraged in God. In fact, if you don't pray, you will faint, Scripture talks about. If you go to Ephesians 6, 18 and pray in the Spirit on all occasions, everybody say all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests with this in mind be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people you're supposed to pray for yourself you're supposed to pray in all occasions you're supposed to pray for all people amen that's what that's what keeps us in in cohesion and in unity in the church is we're not looking at the different kinds of folks we're looking at the kind of prayers we can pray for everybody praying in the spirit and continually engaging in prayer is 
is the scene of Scripture. It's the way that they did it in Scripture. It strengthened one another. It strengthened each other. It strengthened each other in community. We don't just need to have coffee buddies that we go to Starbucks with, but we need to get together like this right now in this place and have the word go forward and have prayers go up and have the reign of God and the blessings of God come down. Amen? There's the spiritual alertness that comes from that. When we gather together and we're talking with one another, Colossians 4 and 2 says, devote yourself to prayer. Everybody say, devote yourself. Devote yourself to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Devotion in prayer is associated with watchfulness and gratitude. If you want to change your life and you want to change your emotions throughout the day, I dare you to start praying gratitude prayers every chance you get. And in fact, they call them in in in. in you know, like self-help, they call it magic moments where you take something in your day and you're grateful for even the littlest of things. The littlest of things happen and you say, thank you, Lord, for this or, or thank you for that. If you take that and you put that into prayer and throughout your day, you take two to three prayer moments where you say, thank you, God, that I have children. I've been blessed with having children. Thank you, God, that I have a job. Thank you, God, that I can walk from my car at the end of the parking lot because there's no parking parking spaces from here to the door, but I get the exercise. Thank you, God, for exercise. You can thank God for anything. If you change how you see life, not how things happen to you, but how you appreciate the little things, those moments of prayer will change the way you live your life. Amen, somebody. And it will change your emotion level. How do you, how many people know somebody that has a lot of money and they're miserable? How many, how many people know somebody that has someone that loves them, but they're still miserable? It's not about relationship or money. It's how you approach life. And if you approach life with a prayerful attitude, you will be given over to a beautiful walk with God. You'll get up in the morning and say, thank you, Jesus, for another day where your mercies are made new. Amen? How many have done that before? We just had someone talking about that in life group this week. Colossians 4.2, devote yourself to prayer. And being watchful and thankful. Romans 8, 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit itself intercedes. Here's what I'm talking about. We're praying in the Holy Ghost. And the Spirit begins to intercede for us through wordless groans. Where we get into a moment of prayer where we can literally pray for someone else's needs and our own. It's very important that we understand that God not only, not only builds you when you have a prayer life, but he benefits you. He benefits you. Jeremiah 10, 23 tells us that we are supposed to be guided by God. Lord, I know that people's lives are not their own. It is not for them to direct their steps. And maybe while you're reading that, you thought of Proverbs 16, 9. Did you know that God also wants us to make him Lord, but also he wants to direct the very steps of our life. In their hearts, humans plan their way or course, but the Lord establishes their steps. Thank God that when we pray, he architects our way. Can I say it again? Thank God that when we pray, he architects our way. Because the Bible says that you, you don't have the ability to know enough about what's coming in your future to analyze all the different factors and make the best choice. You have to weigh things. You have to make plans. I'm not saying there's only spiritual and not application. I, I know people that are super spiritual and they don't take the practical and, and make any plans for their life. But as you, the scripture has said, as you make your plans, those plans may get altered a little bit, but that might not just be somebody oppressing you, somebody holding you down from coming up. It might not be any of that. It might be God working to make sure your steps go where they need to go. So you make your plans in the natural, and then you pray for supernatural organization and let him just kind of move things out of the way and alter things a little bit. And you might think you were going to go from point A to point B, but you went to point A, point B, C, D, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, and that's how you got there. God's going to work it out, but all along that way, he's going to save a family member. He's going to reach a loved one. He's going to help you be a witness and a light, and you never thought you would be. He's going to help you do something so beautiful that it's going to benefit you when you look back at what God did. Prayer life will benefit you. Number three, and I only have four, 
A prayer life fights battles for you, Ephesians 6, 12. For our struggles are not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. When you go to prayer, God fights the battle for you. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 4, for, through, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Amen? And I'm, what we're going to talk about Nehemiah next week, huh? I'm so impressed with this man, his passion, his love for rebuilding the walls. And he said, this, this, this is how we're going to do it. In Nehemiah's story, you see how to, to, to organize a team if you're a leader. You see how to build the morale of a team. You see all of this stuff in his story as a, as a leader and as a person. But he says, let's start with the section of wall that's just outside our house. What if we all went home today and made a commitment to start prayer in our house, whether you're praying right now or you want to pray more or you have an altar at home or you want to have a better altar at home, what if we went home and took on the role of making a difference through spiritual warfare and prayer, amen, by building the wall right outside our doors and saying, no, devil, you're not coming in here. This is a household of faith. And as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. James 5, 16, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Everybody say powerful and effective. It avails much, King James says. It makes a big difference, but I don't see a big difference, Pastor. And I, I, I'm not in ministry. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I just have a job that I work and I just pay my bills and I'm responsible and let me say something about this. Nehemiah was not a priest, but he decided to make a difference. He was the cupbearer of King Artaxerxes. And what that means is he would eat the food of the king, so if it was poisoned, he'd die and the king would live. Or he would drink the king's cup, and if there was poison, he would die and the king would live. And he got so burdened by what was going on and the breakdown of Jerusalem and Judea and Judah, that he wanted to go back and rebuild the wall. They had built the temple, but they hadn't built the wall. About 10 acres of land there. They want, he wanted to rebuild that wall and see God do something great. So he leveraged his position to ask for finances and the ability to go. He was overwhelmed with it, and the king honored him. God will help you fight those battles if you pray. Amen? Matthew 26, 41, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Number four and the final point, God, when you have a prayer life, God blesses you. Everybody say blesses you. Everybody say number one, he builds you. Number two, he benefits you. Number three, he battles for you. And number four, he blesses you. The Bible contains numerous verses that talk about God blessing his people. Matthew 7, 7 through 8, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will open unto you. For everything, everyone who asks receives the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Notice in that scripture that it's asking you to do something. You're going to need to go seeking. You're going to need to go knocking. And then the doors will be open. If you just sit and swing legs and you do nothing, you prop yourself up and you just say, I'm going to sit here till Jesus moves on my knee. God might be saying, I want to move through somebody to bless you, but you have to move to them. You have to get in that environment, and they have to see your need. I'm so thankful for God answering needs that we didn't even pray about because he knows what we have need of. Psalms 34, 4 through 5, I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. How many know that you have a deliverer 
You have a deliverer on tap to call any time for your fears. When fear tries to run you over and shame comes, look at what it says. Those who look to him are radiant. Oh, let's talk about light a little bit, brothers and sisters. Their faces are never covered with shame. He takes care of your fears, your shame, and he brings light to dark places. Seeking the Lord in prayer is associated with answered prayers in Scripture, deliverance from fears, and radiance indicating the blessing and favor of the Lord. He blesses you when you have a prayer life. Prayer is linked to the experience of God's peace that surpasses all understanding. And the peace of God that it talks about is a peace of God that we can't wrap our minds around. And then James 5, 16 says, Therefore confess your sins to each other, pray for each other, and you'll be, you'll be healed. The righteous person is powerful and effective. That, that's another verse that I pulled. Psalms 118, 5 says, When hard-pressed, I cried to the Lord, and he brought me into a spacious place, a wide open place. First Timothy 4, 4 through 5 says, For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. There's a Professor Dunbar, and I'm trying to close at Oxford University, he did a lot of study on psychology and neuroscience. And he presented a lot of material just recently about what it takes to develop a friendship with somebody. To go from a stranger to an acquaintance, it takes 30 hours of investment. This is a general rule. He said to go from an acquaintance to a friend, it takes 50 hours of investment in that friendship. And to go from a friendship to an intimate relationship. If you have that graph, I'll, I'll look at that just now. It takes 300 hours to develop a close relationship. And so this is a graph that he built. You have only about 1.5 people that you're capable of having an intimate relationship with. I think God's plan was right, don't you? That he knew that we needed one person in our life. And so I'm thankful that I know that. I don't know who the point five is, but that person's really going to get robbed in my relationship because I only got one. Amen. So this is the center is 1.5. That's what your mind and your capacity can, can support in an intimate relationship. And then you go to close friends. You can only have about five close friends. And that includes the people in the previous circle, his material said. And then you can have 15 best friends, but that includes all those in the intimate circle and your close friends. And then you can have 50 good friends if you're capable of that. Some people cannot support 50 good friends. I'm very careful about telling somebody I will be their friend because we're all limited resources, right? Right? We have to earn our living and all of this. You can do 150 friends, possibly. You have the capabilities of having 500 acquaintances. You know, those are all the people that are on Facebook that are your friends. You don't know where they live. You know those people? You have 500 that you can be acquainted with. You can do 1,500 known names. Your brain can support that. And you can do 5,000 known faces. Have you ever had someone say, I don't remember names or but I never forget a face? That's those people. And his material says that you're going to need to spend 300 hours to get close to anything that you want to be a part of, you want a part of your life. And so as, we, as I was praying over this and I was asking God, how do I compel our church to see the biggest change we've ever seen of influx of loved ones, influx of souls, revival, people getting the Holy Spirit, people falling on their face in prayer and seeking God. How do I do that? And he, of course, took me to the very familiar passage. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I'm fighting my, my iPad. In Second Chronicles, if you guys would help me pull it up. It's at the bottom of my notes, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. 
It's as if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will forgive their sins and will heal their, heal their land. And I couldn't think of anything we need more right now than a healing in our land. I couldn't think of anything more we need than to seek God's face and to turn, see people turned from their wicked ways. Would you stand with me today as I close and, and try to impact you with an understanding that this was a response to Solomon's prayer? Solomon, it was the high point in Israel's history where they're dedicating the temple and they have done all of these sacrifices and they've given so much of their time to prepare and, and God responds and says, not if the world will turn their heart, but if the people of God will turn their heart. If the people of God that are called by his name, we've already got it. This isn't a salvation prayer. This is a turning things around prayer. This is a bringing things back to where they need to be prayer. And I'm asking today, would you make a commitment to God? The one who is able to do anything that you could call on and say, Father, would you do this for me? And he will do it. He won't chide you. He won't say, you don't even know what you're asking. But God will reach down and do what you have asked of him. So today I wonder, is there anyone that wants to move 30 hours into their relationship with God? Anything moving closer to God is worth doing. Is there anybody willing to move into a deeper friendship with God? I, I don't know about you, but I'm wanting to spend even more time with God than I ever have before as I get older. And I'm asking, is there somebody that wants to know him and the power of his resurrection? Like Paul, where he... He said, I, there's nothing else I want than to be in God's presence. If you'll make any of these journeys, I want you to come and take one of these papers and remind yourself, put it somewhere, 30 hours. I'm going to commit for the next half of a year or year or whatever it takes, I'm going to commit to 30 hours of prayer. And the benefits are going to be will far outweigh how much you invest. I'm going to commit 50 hours of prayer. I'm going to commit 300 hours of prayer. This is already on my board in my prayer closet. And I'm asking the Lord to help me do this as fast as possible. It's going to take a big commitment. But I'm willing to give up my leisure time. Because I want this place full of people. I want people to experience the worship service that we just had where God was moving in this place. I want them to sense the anointing that happens whenever Tanya started singing that song about a holy God and where we can stand in the presence of friends and family and say, this is what heaven is going to be like. I'm committed to it. I don't know if you can commit to it at that level. I pray you can but I'm calling this whole church to prayer and fasting. And today is the day that we make a commitment to pray. Would you bow your heads with me, Jesus? I want to give you 30 hours of my life. There's nothing more important than being in your presence, Jesus. And I pray somebody takes on a burden today to reach for you in ways they have never reached for you before. I pray somebody steps out and makes a difference through prayer. That they get a hold of the power of prayer and they say, God, I want to be close to you again. I need you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. I'm going to seek your face, Lord. was a close with this story. There was a missionary and he he had to walk through the woods to get home. And this will illustrate everything I'm trying to say to you today. To walk through the woods to get home and there was a group of men that decided they were going to beat him up, steal everything that he had when he got into the woods. 
and they were going to kill him and take his life. They were upset about what the missionary was doing in the place where he was ministering. And so he began to walk into the woods just another day home. He was going to be blindsided by these men. When they got in the woods, he just, they never attacked. And later, one of the men of the group came forward and confessed and said, we were going to kill you that day. We were going to follow you into the woods. We were going to take your stuff and, and kill you. He said, but when we got into the woods, there was 36 men standing around you in armed guard apparel. He said, I was all by myself. There was nobody with me. And later that missionary went to one of the Pentecostal churches in Michigan and he was sharing this story. And a man in the congregation raised his hand and said, can I say something? And he stood up and he said, that same time of that same day, I felt to get men together at the church to pray for you. He said, would you all stand up who came to pray for the missionary? And 36 men stood up. I'm telling you, this isn't just hope so stuff. The power of prayer and time with God changes things. It builds you. It battles for you. It protects you. And so I'm not asking you to just make an investment. I'm asking you to change your life and change the life of those around you through prayer. Jesus, help us to hear your call today. There's nothing more important we can do. Everything can wait. This altar is open. Would you come? And I pray that you would make a commitment today. Jesus, we need you. Jesus, we need you. We need you to move. If you would make a commitment today, would you pray for a minute and ask God to help you to rebuild whatever you need to rebuild in your life. But mostly today we're talking about reconstructing prayer, reconstructing a time with God. And then would you come and you take a commitment? This is not a light moment. This is a heavy commitment that I want you to make. But I'm calling on you to make it in faith, believing that you'll be able to keep it. Jesus. Jesus. I would that in the church we would lift our voice. Just begin to pray. God, would you help us? If there's something you need to take to the Lord, would you do that right now? Lord, you know the concerns that are on somebody's mind and heart right now. You know a problem or a, a situation that's come to this altar with them. God, I'm praying you allow us to release our time and trust that you're going to redeem the time that we give to you, that we take moments we can never return to, but we give them to you, that you would invest them in our life and that you would meet us in these moments. You're the one who walked on water. The one who walked on water. You deserve my time. Come on, reach for him right now. He deserves our time. He gives us the breath of this day. He deserves our days. He deserves our moments. I'm praying for a commitment to break loose in our hearts. Where we give Him more time in our life. We don't just run through our day saying, Jesus, I know you're there. I know he loves to walk with us. But what if we could make a dedicated moment where we say, I'm going to give you an hour. I'm going to give you 15 minutes a day and build up 300 hours, God. I'm going to build up 50 hours. I'm going to build up 30. And I promise you, your life will change. Your life will change. It'll be forever changed. I promise you, this is not something that will not affect you. Your commitment here will forever change your future. He's an amazing God, and he responds when we reach out. More than when we step into moments with him. Call on him by may be found. 
call on him while he may be found. love you, Jesus. Move us to prayer, God. With Move us to prayer. Spoken, and you what if we were the one? Free. What if we were the you're one the king who came to serve, that God uses to God save someone? What if we were the one feet. that were in those you're 36 the men that stood and prayed and God spared and the missionary? What if we were the, the one who said, I'm worth I'm, I'm willing to give. You're worthy of it all, God. Forgetting all our sins. Help us, Jesus. You remember all Oh, Father, your help us. Promises. Oh, Father, make you us pray, people. Yeah.